Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Full Momentum and HEC RAS podcast. I'm your host, Ben Carey, and here joining me today, Chris. Welcome back to another episode of Full Momentum. Hey, Ben. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. It's good to see you. Uh, I know you've been traveling around a lot um, out in the field and stuff. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about where you've been recently and uh, all the fun you've had. Because yeah. I've been in the office the whole time, so I, I'm a bit <laughs> jealous. <laughs> I know, I know. I I uh, I do feel a little bit bad sometimes. I have been able to travel out in the field the last couple of weeks, but I will say I paid my dues. It's been about three years since I've been out in the field, so um, it felt good to get out again. And uh, you'll know this as well as anybody. It, it it helps so much to get just get out into streams and into rivers. Um, even if it's not related to RAS modeling, every time you're out, you see something that either reinforces an idea that you know about hydraulic modeling, um, or you learn something new about kind of how rivers behave and how streams behave. Um, it's so helpful when it comes to taking that and applying it to hydraulic modeling. Yeah, for sure. I um, I tell that to people all the time that you know, get out in the field, look at rivers, even if it's low flow, you can get a lot of information, but especially if the river's up, you really see what it looks like when it's flooding or near flooding, but even things like ineffective flow areas and mm -hmm. being able to approximate where those are, um, having that experience of being out in the field and seeing it firsthand is is invaluable. You can't really replace it. You can't get it off an aerial image. You can't get it off of a topo map. You know, mm -hmm. it's the stuff you really only understand when you're out there in person. So that's awesome. Plus being out in the field, not a bad way to spend the day, huh? No, not at all. And I, fortunately, I was able to spend uh, the time in some pretty cool places. I was up in just outside of Anchorage, Alaska, on the Aklutna River um, for a week doing some uh, fish habitat suitability uh, studies on that river. And then was out on the Pacific Coast here on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, uh, where we were doing some field collection, field data collection for some fish passage projects for the Washington State DOT. Um, and then you know, flew over to the other side of the Northwest and spent a week in Idaho, um, mm. up in the Coeur, Coeur d'Alene area, doing wow. some uh, riparian survey stuff. So, yeah, kind of all over the inland Northwest and, and the Northwest coast um, as oh, well wait, as Alaska. Let's, let's see. Alaska, Coeur d'Alene, and the Olympic Peninsula. Like three of the most beautiful places in the in the northwest part of the country here, and you got you nailed them all in, in within a span of a couple of weeks. So yeah, well yeah, done. yeah. No, I, like I said, I, I'm very fortunate. Kleinschmidt, um, you know, super thankful. Kleinschmidt gave me the opportunity, and also, you know, none of this would have been possible without um, our new teammates, um, formerly of R2, but now they're part of the Kleinschmidt R2 team. Um, for those who are not aware. Kleinschmidt uh, merged with R2, which is they're a great um, environmental science, fish passage engineering, water resources firm up here in the Northwest. And they do some really cool field work, some really cool projects in Alaska and, and other places around the Northwest. And all of these opportunities were opened up because of, um, you know, R2 staff. And yeah, uh, yeah, couldn't couldn't be happier to have them uh, as part of the Kleinschmidt team. So, yeah, they do some really fun work. And now now we can officially say we do the same yeah. kind of fun work. So, I mean, we were doing fun work before, but now we've got uh, all new sorts of projects that uh, we get to participate in. And, and so that's really cool. So I got a trivia question for you, Ben. Sure. Because uh, I love trivia. I love asking trivia Me too. questions. Me too. Me too. But do you know what the state bird of Alaska is? Oh, man. Uh, oof. <sighs> It's probably a trick question. I'm gonna. You're on. I'm to gonna. Me. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess it's the bald eagle. That may be correct, but the uh, the funny answer is, and this is a joke that people oh, say, mosquitoes. Is the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Yes. Mosquitoes. yes. Mosquitoes. No, that's, good. Um, that's good. Did you uh, <laughs> run into any bird-sized mosquitoes while you were up in Alaska? Not bird-sized, but uh, <laughs> they were thick. Um, they were yeah. definitely thick. It's you know, part of doing field work is you got to put up with the elements. And in Alaska, the elements are definitely the bugs. Um, fortunately, the Alaskas or the mosquitoes in Alaska 
respect the deet at least. So um, you put a little respect. <laughs> well, well, because uh, there's certain areas where the mosquitoes do not respect the deet, but in Alaska they do. So so, so you just hold up the can and show them. Look, respect <laughs> the deet because I will put it on me. I swear. <laughs> if well, you come you know, anywhere. <laughs> the thing about the thing about that bug spray is you put it on one day and I think it's on your skin for the next couple of days even after showers so yeah. um it, it doesn't it's take much a, it's got a nice scent to it yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly but yeah I mean, it was it was a great time uh definitely encourage everybody um that can get out in the field um even if you have to do it you know on your own dime if it means that you spend some of your weekends hiking out to a river and just walking around and looking at things and looking at them in a in an engineering eye uh, it's, it's really helpful. Good time. And get in the river too. Um, one thing I did when I was growing up, well, not growing up, but earlier in my career, I guess I still was growing up, um, at least mentally growing up. I, um, I was into whitewater kayaking. And so, you know, that boat is really small and you're in that boat. Um, you're kind of a part of that boat, uh, the kayak, um, in fact, when you flip over, you stay in it unless you pull yourself out. <laughs> but that's a fantastic way to really get an intimate understanding of how rivers work and all the little flow patterns and the hydraulics, hydraulic jumps, supercritical, subcritical flow, eddy patterns. Uh, eddy patterns are a very important part of kayaking because these are areas where you can you can slip into to rest. But it's also dangerous because when you pull out of a netty, you can tip your boat over really quickly if you're not ready for it uh, and spin you around. So uh, great way to get to know the rivers, just being out there. But also, hey, if you can get in the river, get in a boat, uh, inner tube, canoe, whatever, um, really get get in there and interact with the river. It all helps. Yep. Helps yep. with the modeling. So awesome. Well, hey, Ben, I um, I understand that you did some really cool modeling not too long ago speaking of uh, beautiful parts of the country um, mm -hmm. and especially in the northwest up on the mackenzie river uh, why don't you tell everybody about uh, what you did in this really cool trick that we pulled out to get it to work yeah thanks chris it's a, it's a i'm glad you brought that up um yeah, and chris and i always like to do a kind of a current events little uh check-in on in the water resources community and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about a uh, presentation that I was able to give at a conference um, in the last couple months. Um, I was able to present at the United States Society on Dams or USSD, their annual conference. It was an online conference this year, which was a bummer. Um, but, you know, we're looking forward to getting back in person next year, undoubtedly. Um, but I was able to present on a project that Chris and I worked on um, a, a little bit ago. And it was on, like Chris said, the Upper Mackenzie River. And it was a really cool project because there was a unique uh, geologic bend to the project that influenced the way we set up our HEC RAS model. That is not a, you know, it's not something that I had ever done previously. Um, and as far as I know, it's not something that's done super commonly. Um, but in this particular aspect, uh, it was needed. Um, and we'll talk about why that is here in a second. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to show some of the slides from my presentation, uh, USSD. Um, just to kind of give you guys some context and allow, um, you know, because the the slides that I have in here do a pretty good job of, of showing some of the context of, of the presentation. So I'm going to go through a little bit quicker than I did for the conference, obviously, for time's sake, uh, but it allows you guys to kind of get a gist uh, of what the project was. So the presentation, the title of the presentation was 2D Dam Breach Modeling with a Subterranean River Reach, which is a pretty cool name. Um, it, it, it's a pretty cool project. So like Chris mentioned, um, the project was located on the Upper Mackenzie River, which is uh, in central Oregon, uh, just east of the Willamette Valley, east of the Corvallis and Eugene region, for those of you guys who are aware. Um, it's a really beautiful area of the country. It's a great, a great area for hiking, mountain biking. Um, it's not just, you know, just outside of Bend. So it's a, it's a really cool area if you ever have a chance to check it out. Um, but the Upper Mackenzie River has some really unique uh, geologic aspects to it, particularly at the upper end of the river, um, there was a volcanic eruption a few thousand years ago um, from the Belknap Crater here in Central Oregon, and that eruption caused lava flows to move westerly uh, and actually block the existing Mackenzie River Channel at the time. Um, so if we zoom in here, we can kind of see the remnants of that lava flow uh, in this area here. 
And it's likely that when that lava flow came in and, and blocked the McKenzie River, it both shifted uh, the location of the main channel of the McKenzie River and also forced a portion of it to go subterranean um, because this lava flow, um, the result of it created a lot of lava tubes and areas with a, a high amount of infiltration. And so there's a, a good amount of the upper McKenzie River that is completely subterranean. And we have some evidence, um, photographic and video evidence of that. And I'll show you guys that in a second. Um, but again, so here's that lava flow. You can imagine that that came in here, blocked the river, caused some of it to go subterranean and probably caused the location of the channel to actually move. Um, and the result, if you walk around, you can see some of these really, really cool geologic features. You can see some of these lava tubes and sinkholes that are a result of that lava flow coming through not too long ago in geologic time. Um, and what this means is that when there's water released from the Carmen Dam, which is just um, kind of at the upper end of the upper Mackenzie River Valley here, um, when there's water released from the Carmen Dam, a lot of that surface water, in fact, all of it under a certain flow threshold infiltrates into the ground and never makes it down to um, Blue Pool Falls, which is a really, really cool, unique geologic feature I'm going to touch on here in a second. Um, but because there's so much infiltration capacity in, the, in this lava flow, um, it made Chris and I think, and the client um, that we were working for, you know, should we take that infiltration into account when we're doing a dam breach analysis? Normally, you would never take infiltration into account for a dam breach analysis simply because the flood wave that's going to be produced from a dam breach um, is going to be so significant that any small amount of infiltration in the river channel isn't going to really impact the results. But in this case, uh, because of how significant the infiltration capacity of the, the area and the lava flow there is, uh, we thought it would be the right thing to do to at least run a sensitivity analysis and explore what incorporating infiltration into the RAS model would do to a sunny day breach uh, analysis. And so that's what we did. Um, but for those of you guys who are who know a lot about HEC RAS, um, before 6.0, there wasn't a, a way to incorporate 2D infiltration into a 2D area. Um, and so we had to come up with a creative way to incorporate that into our model. And I'll kind of show you guys some, some quick pictures here to illustrate um, what we did. So like I mentioned, uh, Car the Carmen Dam, Carmen Hydroelectric Facility Dam is up here, the upper end of the upper Mackenzie River. Um, it then flows down into Tamalich Falls or Blue Pool Falls for those of you guys who are familiar with the area. And Blue Pool is a, is a really, really pretty area. Um, it's got really blue translucent water. Um, it's, it's again, a, a, quite the site if you have some time to ever get up and explore here in the Northwest. Um, and all of this river, all of this water in Blue Pool, um, the reason it's so clear is because the majority of inflow into into this this uh, falls area or this pool is groundwater flow. So it's been you know filtered through lots of cobbles and gravels and lava um, type rock, and so it, it comes out very very clear and blue. Chris, I think you've been up there a few times. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's actually my video, and uh, it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen from a you know hydraulic standpoint. Going out and looking at this pool. There's absolutely no water flowing in that I can see. And then you go yeah. to the other side here and all of a sudden you've got a river coming out. Yeah. So how is that possible? Well, <laughs> as you mentioned, it's it's all coming in from the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is bizarre. The, again, like we talked about, um, there's we have evidence to indicate that a, a, a good portion of the river has gone subterranean in this area. And some of that evidence is like Chris is saying, we have this more or less constant base flow that's coming into this pool. Um, and that's from that subterranean river reach, and it happens to just exit at Blue Pool. And so these are three different flow conditions that we have here. We have a low flow condition where there's less than 500 CFS being discharged from the spillway, a moderate flow, which is 500 to 1,000 CFS over the spillway, and then a high flow event where we have some sort of rain on snow or rainfall event in the upper watershed, and the, the dam is releasing quite a bit of water. And you can see that this is Tamalich Falls, and you can see how at these different flow levels, Tamalich Falls is completely dry. It's got a little bit of water or quite a bit of quite a bit of torrent coming over. But our groundwater input in all three of these, which is kind of highlighted by these red circles here, is very very similar. Um, there's almost no um, difference in that base flow into, into uh, Blue Pool, and part of that is just because again uh, the portion of the river that's gone subterranean takes a lot longer to move through the system, and so there's a lot more attenuation of these small spikes in flow that you may see. Um, so it's a really unique system, uh, and it was something that again presented a challenge to us because we wanted to incorporate um, uh, infiltration in, into this 
this 2D RAS model. So you can see here in this photo, and I'll zoom in here a little bit. Um, actually, it might even be better if I'm just able to pull up the model on my computer screen. Let's see if I can do that quickly here. Yeah, while you're doing that, I'll just mention uh, Blue Pool is a beautiful spot. I mean, the the color of the water and just the surrounding area is just an amazing place. I highly encourage you to check it out if you're anywhere near the area, if you're driving through. But I also want to warn people, don't go in the water. Uh, it is ice cold and yeah. uh, people see it as a good place to jump off of a cliff but don't realize how cold that water is. And there have actually been some deaths out there from people doing that. So don't go in the water, just admire it from the rim or from the side and uh, take it in that way. Good, yeah, that's a good note, Chris. Um, so this is our 2D model that we created for this dam breach analysis. So it's a pretty standard 2D model. You can see we have um, you know, coarse, or finer cells in the channel area, coarser cells in the floodplain. But again, basically from the dam, which is up here towards the top of the screen, um, downstream to Blue Pool, which is right here where my cursor is, um, there's a lot of infiltration capacity all along this reach. And so we wanted to incorporate infiltration um, into this sunny day flood failure as that wave moves downstream. Um, because what, what the client has seen, observed, is that if they're discharging less than 500 CFS from the dam, there's no water seen at Blue Pool. And because Blue Pool is such a popular recreational area, um, the conclusion was made that you know, if we didn't include the infiltration into the uh, dam breach analysis, we could be under predicting what the, uh, or I should say over predicting what the flood wave would be at Blue Pool. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate some infiltration into that. But like I said, in, in the current, or at the time in the current version of 5.07, there was no way to incorporate infiltration um, into a 2D model. So what we did is we used um, a little bit of creative uh, creative thinking and we included um, internal 2D flow hydrographs into the 2D area. So many of you know that there are multiple ways to input water into a 2D region. Um, the most standard way is by including boundary conditions on the perimeter of the 2D area. That might be a stage hydrograph or an inflow hydrograph or at the downstream end of your model, a normal depth. You can also include precipitation onto a 2D area. Um, maybe not as many of you know that you're able to actually include internal inflow hydrographs as boundary, internal boundary conditions in a 2D area. And normally- BC those, lines, right? Yeah, exactly, internal yeah. BC lines. And normally those internal BC lines would be used to represent a point discharge from a culvert or another source of water that you've identified in, in, your, in your study area. But what we did for this study is because we weren't trying to add water, we were actually trying to remove a portion of water. We added these internal BC lines at you know, various distances along our river channel and had those flow hydrographs as negative flow hydrographs so that they were withdrawing an amount of flow over the course um, of that flood wave as it moved downstream. And uh, you know, we tried to spread those BC lines out. You can see each of those BC lines is represented here uh, with these red dots. Um, so these are where we included those point um, in negative inflow hydrographs. And we tried to spread those out along the river each to give us kind of an idea of how that would move through the system. It obviously isn't as accurate as if we had a true infiltration layer that we could use um, in, in 2D RAS, but it did a pretty good job. Uh, and uh, the analysis that we did uh, actually indicated that our assumption was correct and that by including the infiltration capacity of this lava flow area or the subterranean river reach of, um, of the upper Mackenzie River, we saw a decrease in peak flood uh, flow at Blue Pool or Tamalich Falls, as well as a increase in arrival time. So the flood wave was arriving a little bit later and it wasn't quite as significant um, uh, of, a, of a flood wave. Um, and so that was you know, a good information for us to have, for the client to have. It obviously you know, it wasn't the conservative uh, approach in this, in this case, right? The conservative answer would be just to assume that there's no infiltration at all on this flood wave. But because we have really good uh, information that indicates that there is infiltration and that does impact uh, what a sunny day breach wave would look like, um, we included that into our report and our sensitivity analysis, and um, you know that was all taken into account when we gave our final recommendation for hazard classification for this dam. So, um, yeah, it was a cool project. Cool. Again, re really happy I was able to present this at USSD. Um, yeah. So what? So Ben, what 
what would happen if, let's say, hypothetically, you had this negative hydrograph, negative discharge hydrograph to simulate infiltration, and there wasn't that much water available? What mm -hmm. would RAS do in that case? Yeah, so in that case, for instance, if you have a negative flow hydrograph in a cell, and the negative flow hydrograph is 100 CFS being withdrawn, but you only have a 30 CFS flow in your river system, you would actually see the, the river there, um, the, the flow as it crosses that boundary condition disappear because it's gonna be withdrawing all of the flow that's available. Um, and that's kind of what we saw in our model. Again, we had these spaced out infiltration um, locations. And so as that flood wave moved down, it didn't disappear, but it was reduced in, in size and timing, so. Yeah, so it, it only takes what's available. If it, if there's not enough water there, it'll just take what what is there, and then it yep. goes dry uh, until yep. more water comes in. So it, it looks at the volume available, and it takes either that or the amount that you specify, whichever is greater. Totally, yeah. Or and less, so, I and, guess, whichever is less. <laughs> and there were some other lessons learned in this um, that we learned as far as application goes. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention uh, is related to the new 6.0 infiltration capacity, or I should say the new 6.0 infiltration feature. Um, when we had heard that 6.0 was was going to have an infiltration feature, uh, my assumption was that that would be a perfect application for this project. Um, but I ran that by Gary Bruner, who's a friend of the program, um, and he confirmed that that actually wouldn't help us in this case because the infiltration uh, feature in 6.0 simply reduces the precipitation that's being applied to a 2D area uh, based on the type of infiltration approach that you use, of which there are many in the new uh, RAS 6.0 version. Um, but in this case, where we have surface water moving over a 2D grid, that infiltration option actually won't uh, withdraw any flow um, based, on, based on that infiltration layer that you used. So if you wanted to do a project similar to this, where you wanted to include some infiltration capacity uh, into a 2D RAS model, this might still be one of the better ways to do that, um, which is kind of cool because we thought that this might be irrelevant by the time we presented uh, the information. But in reality, it's still a pretty good approach for representing this type of stream. Yeah, that's, that's really good intel, uh, Ben. The other thing I wanted to point out too is the way we did it is we actually had these discrete locations where we included these internal BC lines with yeah. uh, discharge withdrawals. Another way to do it to get a more uniform withdrawal of water is to draw one big long BC line along the axis mm. of the river. And you could mm -hmm. do that as well. The problem there is we felt like we wouldn't have as much control over it. And um, it just seemed like yeah, having the discrete locations were just, it, it was just going to give us a better result um, versus the lump. But that's another one that I've seen people do not for, I haven't seen people do that for withdrawals, but I've seen people do that for inputs. Uh, inputs yeah. So kind of, yeah. it, it'd be analogous to a uniform lateral inflow that you might use on a 1D model, for example. Totally. Yeah. I think I've seen that too for, you know, people trying to represent groundwater inflow into a system. That's a yep. pretty common application for that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, it would be interesting to try it that way and see if the results were different. If we had a ton of time, that would be kind of a fun thing to do. Um, but regardless, this was kind of a cool uh, approach that we developed for this project. And again, was happy to present that at a conference. If you guys have any questions about that, feel free to leave them in the comments of this video. Um, we'd be happy to answer them for you. But in the meantime, Chris, that's enough of me talking. I know that you have some I know that you have some cool things to talk about today specifically related to the final 60 release as well as you know some new features that are part of that. Yeah, I'm going to go over uh a couple or well, three new things that uh many of you have probably seen but maybe don't know what they are yet or what it's for. <laughs> but uh that was really good though by the way Ben and I I love hearing geology talk combined with hydraulic modeling is just that's one of my favorite things so well, you know, having that volcano pour in and shift the river over to the side and it was only a couple thousand years ago too and so in fact when you go up there you can still see lots of fresh uh lava obviously it's it's all what, what what's the, the word frozen uh, do you say frozen yeah. lava i don't know but it's it's, it's hard and salt um yeah. and has been for many thousand of years but it's not like this was you know, a hundred thousand years or a million years ago. This was just mm -hmm. a couple thousand years ago. Uh, so it's pretty cool terrain up there. Definitely. Definitely. 
Yeah, so let me uh, let me first, I want to uh, just give you guys uh, a quick heads up about um, you know, something that is new with the new RAS version, version 6.0. This is out, it's official, it's no longer beta anymore. So go get that from the HEC website if you have not yet. But one thing I wanted to point out is on the HEC website, they've added all of their documentation or almost all of their documentation in an online format. And there's a couple ways to do that. You could just Google uh, HEC RAS. It'll take you there. Um, uh, maybe after you see the full momentum podcast, but then, then you'll see the HEC website. Uh, another quick way to do it is go right into the help menu item and you, you'll see on here online documentation. Click on that and that takes you to the online documentation site. So let me pull that over here. All right, and this is what it looks like. And you can see they've already got seven manuals up. Um, that's almost all of them. I think there's a few more that uh, they're still working on, but uh, you've got the user's manual, uh, 2D user's manual, RAS mapper manual, hydraulic reference and, and so forth. And so all you do is you click on whichever manual you wanna get into and you can see here's the table of contents. Everything is linked. So if you want to expand that, just click the button. You can see all the different topics. This is essentially what's in the PDF uh, user's manual that comes with the software that you can download onto your computer. The only difference here is though, this is continually updated. So you'll have the latest and greatest uh, documentation on HECRAS software right here. So if you're not sure you're reading something, it sounds a little outdated, you can always go to the online version and see if it's been updated with something else. Uh, the other thing is you can quickly come in here and check out known issues. And what I like, love about this is the very first known issue is Gary Bruner has retired. <laughs> He's no longer <laughs> taking your call. Uh, so, uh, Cray Price actually pointed this out to me and, uh, made me laugh. So I thought I, I'd, I'd uh, show you guys and notice it's status is unresolved and it will remain that way because Gary is now retired. So, um, but beyond that, it's got some other things in here that they're aware of. And so if you run into a bug or something's not working right, go ahead and check this out, see if that's in here. And, uh, if not, then you may want to send in a bug report to HEC and let them know about it. All right, so let's get on with uh, what I wanted to show you. So many of you have already downloaded the official 6.0 and, and several of you have probably been beta testing or at least trying out the beta version before the official version came out. And you may have noticed uh, a few new buttons at the top of the geometry window. So here's our geometry window. This is the, uh, the uh, famous Muncie data set that we all have when we download the software. But notice up here at the top, we've got three new buttons, reference lines, IC points, and reference points. Okay, the others have been around for at least a little while, um, but these are new. And there's actually not a lot of documentation about them in the manuals. And I know that because I was searching around <laughs> this recently and search and search. I looked at every single manual. I was doing control find, and there's barely any documentation on that. And I think a lot of this is because this was kind of last minute things that were added in and they just hadn't gotten around to adding it. And so it might, it'll probably show up in the online documentation first, or but maybe they'll just point people to the full momentum podcast to uh, get all their information about it. <laughs> I was going to say, never, never fear about lack of documentation. And that's why full momentum is here. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. We fill in the blanks uh, <laughs> wherever the blanks occur, and uh, that's why we're here. So uh, we, let's we, talk we, about we, it. We, we, we create a lot of blanks too, Chris. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, well, let's hope so, or hope not today. But uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll provide a little information that people can take home with them and, and try out. So we've got reference lines, IC points, and reference points. These are all actually very similar in how they behave and what they're used for. In fact, reference lines and referen po reference points are almost exactly the same thing. The difference is, obviously, these are polylines that you can draw in as references, and these are points. Otherwise, they do almost the exact same thing. And what they're used for is they allow you to bring in observed data. So if you set up a reference point, let's say you've got a high water mark there. You can put a, a reference point there. You can assign a high water mark to it. 
in the unsteady flow editor. And then when you're looking at your results, you can have that high water mark show up on your plot mm. with your actual results. So yeah. it shows up together on the same plot. And so if I were to add a reference point, let's say I've got a high water mark here. I'll put it there and I'll call this a uh, high water mark. Oops, that's an M. And there it shows up. And you can do the same thing in RAS Mapper too. Uh, so you, you'd be able to add these in RAS Mapper just like you can in the geometry window. But now once I save this, if I go into my um, unsteady flow editor, and here's another new thing too. You'll see there's a new tab called Observe Data to go with the other new tab, Meteorological Data, which we're not going to talk about today. But under the Observe Data tab, you can add in observed stages, flows, rating curves, and high water marks. So let's say I've got this high water mark. I want to add that in. Just click on the Edit button, and you'll see all of your reference lines, reference points. And even your IC points, I'll get to IC points here in a second. All of those shows up, show up as, as uh, locations where you can add observed data. So I just put this high water mark in here. I could just say, all right, I have a high water mark of 960. Put that in here. Now when I run my model uh, and I look at my results, you'll be able to see that 960 there. And will you see that in the in the, in the post processing, Chris? Where do you observe that that data comparison to the model simulation? So what you can do is when you get into RAS Mapper, you can right click on this, okay, and you'll be able to just like a like a profile line mm -hmm. or um, yeah, a profile line. If you right click on it, you can look at data. You can do a time series of flows, for example, or you can do a time series of water surface. In this case, you could plot a time series of water surface elevations, and this high watermark will show up there along with the results. Cool. And so you can see, oh, how close did I get to that high watermark? Oh, I want, I'm off, so let me change my end values. You know? I'm wondering, too, you, I don't know if, this, if you'll be able to check this right now, but if you go to the stage and flow hydrograph output in the main RAS window, I wonder if you can, you know, you can usually choose different options like bridge or cross section or culvert. Mm. I wonder if there's a way to choose high watermark as one of those yeah. options. I like your thinking. Let's, aha, uh -huh, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Man, ben, Ben, you should, <laughs> you should put, no, I'm kidding. Don't put in your application for HTC. We don't <laughs> know, but, uh, I think you just boosted your resume with that right there. And that is some uh, off the cuff thinking. And Hey, some of you out there might think that uh, we actually rehearsed that in advance. Nope, that is all uh, Ben <laughs> right off the top of his head. So nice work, Ben. Yes, cool. It's right there. And look at this. Oh, let me go to reference points. Uh, Tailwater reference. Okay, so it's not showing the one I added in because obviously I have to compute that first. Yeah, you haven't run the simulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. it is showing one that I put in earlier called Tailwater yeah. reference. And so there yeah. it is. Very cool. And you can look at reference lines as well. And so yeah. I've got a few, uh, there's this transect here that's in there and it shows stage and flow. Man, that's cool, Ben. Uh, good thinking. Yeah, okay. so there's two ways to two ways to view that. One is in RAS Mapper by right clicking on the point and the second is in the stage and flow hydrograph output. Yeah, and you got initial condition points here too as well. Yeah, um, cool. But those don't do anything for you. So I'm not quite sure. Um, but I'll get to initial conditions points in a second here. Um, so when you go to RAS Mapper, let's pull it up here. Um, oh, it's already open. There it is. I'll bring that over here. And uh, there you can see my IC points, but there's also a reference point here. So let me right click on that. And you can see I can plot the time series of water surface elevations. And there it okay. is right there. Now I'm not seeing the results and I wonder if that's because there's no water over there. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and I'll, I'll freely, you know, there's water at some point. So I'm not quite sure how you get them. Maybe if you go up and highlight that, well, I think the oh, results that you're sure. actually—I think the results you're seeing, Chris, are the results from the model. I don't think you're seeing the. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a high water. Um, yeah, I was thinking I put observed data in there. No, you're right. That is the actual results. Now, according to my intel, if this was an observed data point, you would also see that on this plot along with your results. 
Yeah, so but it would just it would just be a single it would just be a single water surface elevation. It, right? Yeah, if it's a high water mark, it would just be a single line across the top, presumably. If you put in, you can put in um, a, uh, a hydrograph, a stage hydrograph, if you wanted to, if you had that data uh, measured. Uh, you can also put in a rating curve too. So, oh, cool. Um, yeah, those are all options you can use for these reference points. So yeah, give that a try. Um, it's great for observed data. The other thing it's good for that um, you will not find in the manuals anywhere, at least I couldn't, is you can now reference your pumps. If you put a pump in a 2D area, uh, you might recall that pumps weren't allowed to be put into 2D areas uh, before. Now you can put a yeah. pump in there. I'm gonna call this pump. And if I left click on that, edit pump station, You've got a pump inlet and outlet, but notice this on off monitor reference. Now we can use a reference point if we want to do that. Interesting. So and and, what, and what, would that, what, would that, what would that allow us to do, Chris? So this this tells this gives the some intelligence to how the pump operates. So it can monitor the results of that location and you can say, hey, when it gets above this point, I oh, want cool. you to kick in the pump. Or when it gets below this, I want you to turn the pump off. Okay. So, so yeah, you can provide some intelligence, and that actually gets to the next thing I wanted to bring up. Speaking of of um, adding intelligence to your model, but you can also use reference points and reference lines when setting up rules for gates. So, some of you may have used rules for gates before, and when you do rules for gates, um, so let me back up. If you put a gate in, so I've got a lateral structure right here. Let's say I go into my lateral structure editor, and if I just put in a quick dummy gate here, uh, I'll just put in just the minimum I got that's required. Uh, no, that's not going to work. I don't want to invert an output. I, I know 940 is a good number, so I'll just call this pump one, or sorry, uh, gate one. And put it at 700 station. <clears throat> I'm going to put it at... 20 because I think I don't know how long. Oh, yeah, 700. Okay, I'll put 700. You're right, that would work. And that's going to put it over here somewhere. There it is, right there mm -hmm. at station 700. You can barely see it. I could zoom in here like that. Now you can see it a little bit better. The size doesn't really matter because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use rules. So if I go into the unsteady flow editor here, and if I go up to uh, notice here, it already has rules there because I've already been messing around with this. So normally you would click on this and select the rules. Then you go into the rules editor and this allows you to script in some, some intelligence, some code where you can operate these gates based on the data or the output as it's happening. So RAS will monitor data at different places. Um, it can manipulate, you can actually do math on this data. It's almost endless what you can do in here. It's basically programming code. But it used yep. to be that this only worked in 1D. But now with these reference points, you can actually go in. And, and if I were to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to actually take the time to write code here because it would take too long. But let's say I wanted to get a, a simulation value. I wanted to get a value from the output as the model's running and use that to make some decisions on how to operate the gate. Or really, you can use it to operate other things or manipulate other parts of your data too. But if I went in here to get sim, I'll just go, uh, it's a new variable. Uh, it, it actually really doesn't matter because over here you get to see the simulation variables you can pull out and notice, mm. that, oh, there's our reference points. There's yeah. our IC points, or sorry, reference lines, IC points and reference points. All of those are in there and you can pull out all sorts of different data from that. And yeah. then you can use that to, um, oops, down here's where I wanted to be, reference point. So in this case, it's just water surface elevation. But you can use that to make some, um, uh, to write some logic into this code, like how you manipulate other things like the gate or the yeah, gate. That's really, or anything. Yeah, that's really cool, Chris, because I know that in the past when we've done rules on pumps and gates, um, if we wanted to pull a water surface elevation to give it some intelligence, we've always had to do that using a storage area. So we've had to add in a storage area and then pull that yeah. elevation from the storage area, which has worked, but it's a pain because that means you have to add a storage area to a 2D model. And in this case, you don't have to do that. You can just simply add reference points to your 2D model and then allow the reference points to extract data during the simulation and then use that information to manipulate how gates open or how pumps run. That's pretty cool. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Ben, because um, while I love coming up with creative solutions, that storage area thing was yeah. indeed a creative solution, but it, it wasn't perfect and it added complexity to your model and it was kind of a pain to set up. But yeah, like if we wanted to put in a gate here and we wanted to operate it based on rules, yeah, we would have to put in a little mini storage area here, connect that up with the SA 2D area connection to the rest of the 2D area. And that was the only way we could do that. Now you have this reference point. I could put a gate here and I could operate that gate based on this reference point here. Yeah, that's so really, really cool. Slick. So yeah. Chris, what's the biggest difference between reference points and reference lines then? I understand reference points is pretty clear. It's the water surface elevation at a particular point. How does that work with a line? It's really the same thing. I mean, the, you have the same features, the same interactions, pumps, uh, rules, observed data. The difference here is this is a polyline. And so when say let's you let's say you reference this this gate using rules to that that line right there. Um, and uh, what it's going to do is it's going to take the results like the water service elevation and all of these cells that you see highlighted under this line and okay. it averages them. Yeah, okay. it's an average. Okay. And I think it's a flow weight weighted average. I think that's what uh, I was told. It's not a maximum water service. It's not a minimum. It's a flow weighted average here. Okay. So um, RAS will average that out. Same thing if you do observed data, you're going to be putting observed data as an average over that line, whether it's a water surface or, you know, uh, I suppose you could use that line possibly for doing a flow hydrograph too, if you had that data. Uh, mm. But I would rather use stages for my observed data. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So it's really behaves the same way. Now, the difference of these three buttons comes when you use the IC points. Now you probably saw or remember seeing those in the unsteady flow editor under observed data. You can have them in there. Uh, you weren't allowed to see output for it. Um, and so I'm not quite sure why that is yet. Maybe they'll add that later. But what the IC point is actually ma made for is initial conditions, setting initial conditions in your 2D area. That's what IC stands for, initial conditions. And you'll see if I zoom out here, um, <laughs> I lost everything here. Let's uh, let's reopen this and see if it comes back. Oops. Okay. You might see if you can click on the uh, cross section downstream oh, of that. There, oh, there go. you go. Yeah. Yeah, I just used my wheel on the on the mouse and that got rid of it. So that was weird. Um, have not seen that before. But look here, we've got three IC points. IC one, two, and three that I've placed in here. With an IC point, you can go into your unsteady flow editor and go to your initial conditions tab. And now notice my IC points here. Now, for those of you who have been doing 2D modeling already, you know that there is a limitation in RAS with a 2D model and how you start it out, what your initial conditions are. It's either starting out dry, the entire 2D area, or the entire 2D area starts out with a level water surface. Well, now you have the ability to vary that water surface or pick certain areas within your 2D area to start at different elevations if you want to. Now, I'm gonna warn everybody, this is a work in progress. It's not perfect. Um, there's some question marks in my mind about how they actually set up the initial water surface when you've got these IC points close to each other. And I'll tell you what I mean here um, in just a second. Let me pull up RAS Mapper. Yeah, this is, this is really cool, Chris. I mean, you were outlining it, but you know the the classic example of when you'd want to do this is if you have some sort of dam breach analysis or an area where you're modeling a dam the reservoir and the reach and the elevation of your reservoir is going to be much higher than the elevation of your reach but if it's a single 2d area you have to choose one or the other you have to choose either a really high water surface elevation that's going to cause your downstream reach to be completely flooded or you have to start it at a very low water surface elevation and you have to take some time to fill up that reservoir so normally the approach in that situation is to actually split up your 2D area into two separate 2D areas with an SA 2D area connection so that you can start with two different water service elevations. But if what you're saying here is true, that would allow you to start those different areas, both the reservoir and the downstream reach to two different water service elevations, which is huge. Ben, you are on fire today. That is exactly what I was getting to next. So, uh, man, uh, what did you eat today? I want to know because uh, you're on fire. I'm thinking. 
Um, yeah, that is exactly right, Ben. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in a second. Uh, but first, I want to I want to point this out. So notice here, I've got my initial elevation set of 940, 941 and a half, and 943. Now I've brought this all the way back to my initial condition, starting point water surface. And if I hover over here, it's not quite 940. It's 940.18. In fact, this entire area here is 940.18. Mm. And if I go to this one, it's 940.98. And then over here, this one actually got it right, 940. So I'm not quite sure. I think it's got some kind of triangular procedure going on where it's trying to produce a, a slope based on these three points. And maybe if you put in a bunch of points, it would do a better job. Mm. Um, but just be aware, it's a little bit um, wonky, and I, I would call it a work in progress. But Ben is exactly right. Where this comes in as a huge advantage is – when you want to have a reservoir, a 2D area upstream of a dam and a um, 2D area downstream. And maybe we want to make it all one 2D area instead of breaking it up into two separate ones. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to the Bald Eagle Creek data set, you guys can all try this at, at home because you all have this Bald Eagle Creek data set. And there's even a um, data set called, let me get rid of Muncie here so it's not so confusing. So there's even a um, plan called single 2D area. I just copy that and I put IC points on the end of it. And all I did was I put an IC point right here. That's it. And I set that as the, the starting reservoir elevation. Now, there is if you go to the single 2D run in RAS, you'll actually see, if you animate this, that it starts out because it's got 20 hours of initial conditions time. And so it actually fills up to this level, but certainly not to a full pull yet. It takes a whole lot more time before it actually gets to a full pull. In fact, I'll just draw this over here. It started at January at 12 o'clock, January 1st. It's not to a full pull until about right, right there. Right the dam breach. <laughs> yeah. So it, it took, uh, what is that? 44 hour, additional hours. So, 64 hours of simulation time before you can fill this thing up to a starting condition. Well, let's say we don't want to wait 64 hours of runtime. I don't know what that translates to. This model takes a good five minutes or something to run, but it, it could take much longer than that, depending on uh, what kind of model you have set up. So I just put an IC point there and I set that to this water level, 656 or something close to it, ran it took out all of the initial conditions time, in fact. So it just started right away. And there's my initial conditions, 657. Wow. Now, notice it's a level pool. And if I go and I look at this one here, this is not, not quite a level pool, 656. It's close. You can see it gets higher at the upper end, which you would expect it to do because water is moving. There is a gradient through here. Mm -hmm. So maybe you start with this one and add in an hour of initial conditions sure. time just to get that yeah. last little adjustment before you uh, start the actual simulation. So this is a really cool application of those IC points that I, I can see benefits right away. And this would allow you to model this as one single 2D area versus breaking it up into two separate ones. Now, so, why so, why would you not want to have two separate ones? Why keep it one? Um, well, there are some advantages in doing that. And you could technically simulate this at, with the, the uh, normal 2D equations if you wanted to for some reason. Um, it also, I think it does a better job preserving velocity and momentum I was just going to say that that's the biggest thing right there is if you split it up into two 2D areas with an SV2D area connection, you're going to lose the velocity and momentum component across that connection. At least that's my yep. understanding of how that works. Yeah, I, that's <laughs> my understanding too, Ben. So I think that's the advantage there. Plus, you know, the simplicity and, and kind of elegance of having just one 2D area that that can't be really understated. So um, I think this is this is great. It opens the door now to do do dam breach modeling with a single 2D area. Um, now, there's so, still maybe may reasons to break it up, Ben, like maybe I, I don't need this kind of detail up here. You could you could do that with a refinement region or you could break it up into a separate 2D area. But So quick question for you, Chris. So you, I understand that you added an IC point to the portion of the 2D area that's just upstream of the dam. And you yeah. set an initial water service elevation of that IC point. 
And it, what that resulted in is it resulted in a water service elevation upstream of the dam that was whatever you specified as that IC point. Mm -hmm. Why didn't that same elevation get applied to the rest of the downstream reservoir? Yeah, so my understanding, the way this works is very similar to when you set a, a downstream boundary condition. And you know how we talk about this in the class, Ben, the smart yeah. projection it does. So if you yeah. set a water level of, you know, 900, it's going to not only put 900 right on the boundary, but it's going to project that 900 as far as it will, the terrain will allow it. And so that's, as soon as for, yeah, that's that's for if you're using a downstream stage hydrograph, right? And then you're using the initial stage to compute yep. that smart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think the same thing is happening here. Is you put I put an IC point there, right? So it's going to set that as uh, what did I do? 956, I think. But yep. it's going to go from cell to cell and say, hey, can this water move into this cell at 956? If yes, then it's going to fill that in. Now, when it gets to a high ground feature um like this dam for example and it's all higher than the starting pool or the the ic point that i put in here so it won't project beyond that but it continues to go upstream as long as the terrain allows it to do that yeah you know even better chris is we, you know that one workshop that we do it's one of the first workshops in the class where we have the students assign an initial water service elevation to the river reach, which is which it's all a reservoir. And there's that one portion of the reservoir that has some protected levees on the outside. Yeah. And those the inside of those the outside of those levees that are supposed to be protected always start with water service elevations because of the fact that when you do just an initial water service elevation in a 2D area, it's going to put uh, that water service in every single cell in the 2D area that has an elevation below that specified initial water service elevation. But if you use the initial conditions uh, or the, uh, the IC points, instead of specifying an initial water service elevation, that'll use the smart projection. So you would avoid having those levied off areas starting with water. So it's even yeah. more powerful than just simply being able to start a reservoir at a higher elevation than a downstream river reach. It also avoids starting some of those low lying areas that are protected by uh, um, uh, those uh, a levy or something like that, avoid starting with water in those, which can be kind of a headache for people doing 2D models. Yeah, and this is the spot you're talking about right here. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. we should we should definitely work that into the into the class. So yeah, uh, those, those of you who want to take some 1D 2D training, uh, um, we'll we'll talk about this in the next offering, which is a perfect segue, Ben, nice. to nice. our next class. Yeah, I love how you, you set me <laughs> up for that. Thank you. Um, so we have a, another class coming up in August, in fact. And um, it's it's the 1D, 2D class that we've been teaching. It's online. Um, we have the exact date set, and it's going to be over a course of six weeks. So we meet once a week for four hours, and we have a lot of fun, just like this podcast. But we get into much more detail and and we teach you how to do 1D and 2D HECRAS modeling combined. And um, and then we uh, we let you go after each session with workshop instructions. So you get to work on those uh, in between and and then come back and we discuss the workshop. We answer questions and we we are even known to give away things like really cool T-shirts. So um, it's a lot of fun. If you're interested, I'm going to put a link here at the uh, in the uh, comment section of the the video YouTube video mm -hmm. for you guys to get some more information. You can always go to our website at kleinschmidtgroup.com and yeah, you'll see I'm under right the now. knowledge actually, hub. I, yeah, I'm there right now, Chris, showing them. So oh, you got your screen shown. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there it is. Um, now don't be don't don't worry that if you go to register here, it's it's uh, a little outdated. It's showing our last class. Uh, that's updated, but um, if you go down to the registration button, I think unless no, Jill... they up, they fixed this today. They fixed this. Oh, today. okay, awesome, yep. We're up to great. Speed. It's updated, so it's all ready. Go ahead and register if you want to take this class. We'd love to have you join us. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's online, so it's it's you don't have to travel. It's it's not a big time commitment. It's only four days. Sorry, four hours per week, Wednesday mornings. Uh, at least Wednesday morning Pacific Coast time. So, yep. um, yeah, and um, you can you can hear more of Ben's off the cuff brilliant ideas <laughs> in that class. 
uh, because he brings it every day. <laughs> that's so. that's all the class is is just me setting up chris and chris setting up me that's all it is so yeah. we try to make ourselves look look good yeah that's, that's, it's just an it's just an it's just a four-hour ego boost session that's all it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but it's cool. it's great we have a good time and there's a lot of knowledge sharing going on so if you do need some training on 2d hecraz um come reach out to us and we'll get you hooked up totally yeah so just yeah. to recap if you're interested in taking our 1d 2d modeling class it starts on August 18th. It runs for six weeks through six weeks through September 15th. It's one at, it's one session a week, four hours a session. Um, so it's nice because you can still do your normal workload. It doesn't require a bunch of travel or commitment, um, and it's a great way to learn. We've gotten amazing feedback. Chris and I used to teach this class in person um, over three days, so it's very concentrated. And there are some benefits to that, but we really feel like this online format and the more spread out um, curriculum really helps people retain information better. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. Highly encourage you guys. Um, even if you feel like you're a, a HECRAS 1D expert, you're really comfortable in that area. Um, this 1D, 2D class will really take your, your RAS modeling to the next level. I definitely would encourage everybody to do it. Plus, Chris might've mentioned this, we do cover some of the new 6O topics like like 2D bridges, we have a workshop yeah. where you can do a 2D bridge and build that and get, get some practice with that. And that's a huge addition to, to HEC RAS. We talk about spatial precipitation and infiltration, some of the new 1D uh, finite volume solver, um, the new terrain modification tools. All those are included, uh, at least in the lecture portions of the class. So it's really valuable to those of you who are uh, really comfortable with RAS now, but would like to learn more about 6O. For those of you that um, maybe are brand new to RAS and you're trying to you know, up your game. It's a really, really good course. I'm um, not to toot our own horn, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also while we are doing these online courses, Ben and I love traveling. So if you live in a really cool place and want to have a course there and set up, uh, you know, let us know. We're always good even, for uh, visiting new places. Even if you don't live in a really cool place, if there's some group hubs <laughs> around, you can probably yeah. get us to come out. Well, so. Yeah. 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 We, we can deal with that. So Anyway, cool. yeah, cool. Well, that's great. And uh, Ben, thanks for that that uh, presentation on um, infiltration, ways to do infiltration. I think that's very beneficial. And so, um, yeah, good to try, folks. I mean, just to recap, you know, it's been an hour. We covered ways to include infiltration in 2D areas. Chris talked about IC points, reference lines, and reference points. It's a lot of good stuff there, folks. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a solid that's a solid. Uh, full momentum episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we enjoyed being back here. Again, uh, apologies that we're not doing these more frequently. We'd love to to be doing that. Uh, but like everybody else, it seems like right now we're really busy doing a lot of cool project work, traveling around the, the country, doing some field work. Um, but we like to do these guys, these things for you, you all. And um, we'll try to do the next one sooner than uh, sooner than we did. And we did this one. So yeah, and next time you're out in some place really cool like Alaska, um, we'll actually have the real background behind you, and we'll do a vodcast. That sounds instead like a, of, that instead sound, of one of these fake virtual ones. That sounds like a, a good good plan. So anyway, <laughs> thank you guys again for uh, listening to this today. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Sign up for the class if you're interested. Otherwise, until next time, uh, this has been Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. Thanks, guys.